A new AI tool is hoping to cut the rate of high myopia in young Singaporeans through early intervention. Now, the AI can predict the risk of children getting the condition later in their teenage years. The innovation is by the Singapore National Eye Center's Myopia Center and Singapore Eye Research Institute. Well, we're joined by Associate Professor Marcus Ang. He's advised at SNEC's Myopia Center and also principal investigator of this AI study. Thanks for joining us this evening. Thanks for having me. Uh, right. Professor Ang, uh, I, we didn't know this until we got you to explain this just as you came into the studio. High myopia is where your short-sightedness exceeds 500 degrees. Okay, and this I stole from your study. We've got an increasing rate of high myopia globally in East Asia. It's 21.6% of young people getting it. How bad is high myopia in Singapore? Well, unfortunately, we are ahead of the curve in Singapore. Uh, 60 to even 80% of our children, teenagers and young adults are myopic. And actually we predict that more than 20 to 30% of our young adults will develop high myopia. And as we discussed earlier, high myopia is actually the condition that we are trying to prevent because mm. high myopia is the condition that's associated with um, you know, uh, visual impairments. Right, so we, we should be alarmed by those numbers. Absolutely. Uh, but w we've tended to take for granted that a child in Singapore is going to be myopic, or, you know, at least some of them at some point. Uh, and it's even associated with childhood very often. So we don't, we're not surprised by it. Uh, high myopia, however, does have uh, some serious consequences, potentially uh, sight-threatening eye diseases later on in life. So tell us something more about that. That's right. So basically, why we're so concerned about preventing high myopia in childhood is because it's irreversible. Once a child or a teenager develops high myopia, the sight-threatening complications only occur later on in life. So if you're an elderly or an adult and you have high myopia, one could develop uh, sight-threatening complications such as glaucoma, mm -hmm. cataract, or retinal complications. All right, uh, and again, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, the point of using AI to do this is because there are several factors associated with developing high myopia. And I quote from your study, as an example, uh, parental uh, experience in this area, the amount of time you spend reading books, that sort of thing. So what AI does in your study is look at all these factors and see patterns that an ordinary human brain would take much longer to work out. Is, is this how it works? Absolutely. So basically what we found as clinicians is that uh, when we assess a child's risk for myopia, there are a few issues. Firstly, they're based, some of the clinical factors are actually subjective, like the one you mentioned, onset of myopia. When did the child start wearing glasses? That can be limited by recall bias. Um, do your parents have myopia? You know, sometimes children or even parents themselves don't even know their own prescriptions. So what the AI tool that we developed uh, has is basically based on objective measures, such as ocular measurements or fundus imaging, where basically it's completely objective. We do not need any subjective input from the patients. So that's one key factor that the AI tool does. Um, the second thing that we do is that we rely on one single baseline assessment. Currently in the clinics, we need to see or we should be seeing the children um, at multiple assessments, you know, to map a trend, you know, maybe over three months or six months to see if their myopia is actually increasing before recommending um, a risk score or treatment, right? Um, what this AI does is a single baseline assessment, uh, which is enough to predict a child's myopia or risk of developing high myopia later on in life. So it has a number of capabilities, but has it been able to address all of the unmet management needs, perhaps, of myopia and the treatments available? That's a great question. So actually, this paper is just the first step. Um, it will allow clinicians to have an assistive tool to help us gauge a child's risk. So the next step really is implementation. So we're currently doing that in a prospective study to see what its, how its performance is like in the real world. Can we tweak it? Can we make it better? Can we include other parameters that we haven't thought of? And of course, look at treatment response, uh, which is also in the pipeline. Uh, Professor Ang, uh, uh, may, I may have overlooked this, but how did you, okay, after you had this predictive study, 
How do you assess that it is in fact correct? What do you weigh it against to decide actually this thing is worth the amount of time and resources being put into it? Okay, so the way we develop the AI is actually through a training and validation data set. So what we do is that we use multiple data sets from various populations within Singapore to basically challenge the AI algorithm and refine it further. Um, so through repeated testing and validation through multiple, multiple rounds of this, we are then develop a confidence interval, right? Uh, how confident are we that this is accurate? And we found that actually based on the imaging factors that I already mentioned, um, the, the algorithms perform more than 90%. Um, what we, we've also done is to have various um, uh, parameters or combination of parameters so that they reflect clinical practice. For example, in some clinical settings, clinical parameters are widely available, whereas in other clinical settings, you have advanced imaging technology, which you may not have in other countries or in other clinics, for example. So by having different algorithms, clinicians can then choose, pick and choose, which is the most appropriate for their setting. Oh, thanks so much for joining us this evening, Professor Ang. We are speaking with Associate Professor Marcus Ang from the Singapore National Eye Centre. Thanks. Thank you so much.